I am Professor Dr. Chaid Amigilani, working as Rector of Green International University, Lahore, which is one of the largest cities of Pakistan, rather second largest city, and also working as Rector of the University of Faisalabad, which is the third largest city of Pakistan. And the third job I have got is working as advisor to the Vice Chancellor of Health and Services Academy. And I'm Chairman Board of Governors of Afro-Asian Institute and Afro-Asian Institute of Medical Sciences. Today, we are going to discuss very advanced topic I will try to make it very simple. The topic is an overview of ultrasound for peripheral nerves. The first thing is why ultrasound for peripheral nerves examination? We know if, I, I believe most of you are already familiar with the basic physics of ultrasound. And we know that in MR, we use spatial resolution. And elevator technique is another important thing for ultrasound. We can elevate the structures, we can move the structures, we can have dynamic exploration. And eventually with stress maneuvers, which cannot be performed in MR or CT. Ultrasound palpation is another important thing, which is also called ultrasound tinnel sign, in which we can palpate the structures with the help of transducer. I believe that a good sonographer will always feel that the transducer, the probe is part of his hand. So he can easily palpate the things. Another important thing why we prefer to use ultrasound is the opposite side comparison. The contralateral side can be assessed. So this was something about why we perform ultrasound. Now the next question from this slide arises is that what are the peripheral nerves? Most of us know that the peripheral nerve system is one of the two components that make up the nervous system. With the other part being the central nervous system. So one is central nervous system and the second one is peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system consists of nerves and ganglia which lie outside the brain and the spinal cord. So central nervous system is brain and spinal cord and all the nerves except brain and spinal cord are our peripheral nerves. So it is a peripheral nervous system. When we talk about neuropathy, which is the nerve damage, Neuropathy is when nerve damage leads to pain. The patient starts feeling pain due to weakness or numbness of the structures which are being supplied by that specific nerve. Or patient can feel tingling in one or more parts of his or her body. The nerve damage may be because of disease. It can be due to infection or any injury because of any medicine side effect, long-term alcohol abuse, and some other reasons. And sometimes there are no reasons for nerve damage or degeneration. Here you can see the comparison between healthy nerve cell and unhealthy nerve cell. 
Here are the important things. You can see the myelin sheath, which is very regular in the healthy one, whereas in unhealthy, it is damaged myelin sheath. And the pathway will not properly work, and there will be loss of feeling. First will be tingling, then numbness, then weakness and pain. That will be felt in the areas which are being supplied by that specific unhealthy nerve. For evaluation of peripheral nerves, we have to keep in mind few things. The first thing is normal nerve displays an uninterrupted fascicular or filamentous pattern, unlike the intercalated pattern of a typical tendon. The tendons have got intercalated pattern, which is very smooth. Whereas here we have fascicles inside these spots. Here you can see the fascicles. The nerve fascicles are not as tightly packed as the fibers in the tendon. That's why we get these gaps, these anechoic or black areas. Nerves have an epineurium, the covering around the nerve. This is the external sheath that surrounds the nerve fascicle. And epineurium is seen hyperacquic. So these hyperacquic white areas around the nerve are the epineurium. And the nerve fascicles are hypoacquic. So if you look at this nerve, you will find anacric areas, which are the nerve fascicles, and white areas, white bands around it are the epineurium, which is the sheet around it. This is how the nerves appear. You can see the longitudinal view of a normal healthy nerve. And here is a nerve longitudinally. You can see there is a neural tumor. This hypoacquic area is the neural tumor. Along with the nerve, we have got a part of tendon, then is the muscle, subcutaneous, and skin. And below the nerve are also some of the tendons and muscles. But here we have a longitudinal view in which a large neuronal tumor is seen. When we compare normal nerve versus a compressed nerve on ultrasound, we can see this is a normal nerve in which the white area is the epineurium and black or hypo to anechoic area are the fascicles of the nerve. So whole of this is nerve, it is longitudinal view. And when we rotate the transducer at 90 degrees, we will get this cut section. Here is the cut section of the same nerve and you can see the fascicles. Inside and outside is the epineurium. Whereas, if you look at the compressed nerve, it's not heterogeneous. It looks hypoacquic or homogeneously hypoacquic. This is the compressed area. And then distal to that is the swollen nerve. But the fascicular distribution is disturbed. It is distorted. You can see two fascicles are there, but most of them are gone away because it is compressed. We can get proximal nerve swelling. So in order to assess the nerve, if, if we find it longitudinally, then if this is the nerve and we find longitudinally that this is the area which is more swollen, then we can, and the probe is transversely placed, we can rotate it at 90 degrees to get the cut section of the maximum area. Then we can move it in both directions so that we can find the maximum area in the cut section. 
So use short axis scans and measure from the inner border of the echogenic epineurium surrounding the fascicle. So while measuring, we will measure this black area. We will exclude the white area, which is hyperequic. So then we can compare it with the normal one. Measure from the inner border of the echogenic epineurium surrounding the fascicle. Use ellipse formula, which is already given in the, in the ultrasound machines in the software. And where is the site of nerve measurement? This is important. It is where the nerve is maximally enlarged. That's why I told you that this is the measurement and the probe was placed like this and then we rotate it and then we go downward and upward to find out which one is the maximum area then we will measure the maximum area in the width and next is what is the threshold value for median nerve for example the threshold value is Minimum is 9 to 10 millimeters square and maximum is 15. So if it is less than 9, it can be in the pediatrics, but we are talking about adults. If we get below 9, it is compressed somewhere. Then we have to uh, look for the part of that specific nerve proximally and distally to see if it is compressed or not. If it is compressed, the part which is distal to it, and in some cases, part of the proximal nerve uh, will be showing swelling, which will increase the area. Secondly, if it is above 15 millimeters square, we will say that it is swollen. Then is the ulnar nerve. Ulnar nerve is about you can see 7.5 to 7.9 which is almost 8 plus minus 3 it means 5 to 11 will be the normal range for ulnar nerve measured in the in the cut section as we can see in this cut section then is the proximal nerve swelling when we scan be informative in patients with absent motor or sensory responses. Help to interpret ambiguous electrophysiological findings and reduce the need for further exclusionary studies. Provide morphological information about the nerve and its surroundings. So ultrasound scan can provide us these informations about the nerve swelling. This slide is very important for those who want to start scanning of peripheral nerves. Keep in mind there are three types or three groups of nerves, peripheral nerves. The first is large nerves which are ultrasound detectable. For example, the median, ulnar, and radial nerves, which are of the upper limb. We can perform direct nerve evaluation and pattern recognition analysis, quantitative measurements like in carpal tunnel or cubital tunnel syndromes. Then second type is small nerves, which are ultrasound detectable nerves which includes posterior introsius and musculocutaneous nerves. We can have direct nerve evaluation as we can perform for the large vessels, as for the large nerves. The pattern recognition analysis and high-end equipment is required. The third type is difficult ultrasound detectable nerves like the anterior introsius, axillary, and suprascapular. So even these introsius nerves can be detected, but need very good anatomical knowledge and indirect evaluation of the 
innervated muscles. But with expertise, we can scan and we can successfully diagnose most of the pathologies. Let's discuss some important peripheral nerves one by one, how we scan. In upper limb, the high resolution sonography can show normal brachial plexus anatomy. So let's start from the brachial plexus. Mapping of the brachial plexus with broadband high frequency linear transducer, such as 5 to 10 megahertz, 10 to 13 megahertz, and 8 to 14 megahertz is possible. This is how we perform, we start performing. Here is the patient's head, side of the neck. The head is rotated towards the right side. We are scanning from the left. So scanning started from the interscreen region in the screen muscles, the probe position in an axial oblique plane. It's transversely placed, but it is slightly oblique. If this is the neck, the probe is placed like this. So it is cut section and a little bit angulated. The examinations are performed while patients lying supine. And the head would turn 45 degrees to the contralateral side, to the opposite side. And we are looking for this area and you can see the anterior sclene muscle. This is the middle sclene muscle. Our transducer is here. When we put like this, you can see the chin. It is about two to three fingers below the chin and on the side of the neck. And we will find this. Now they will appear on ultrasound. Let me go back. This was the anterior sclene and middle sclene muscle. So here is the anterior sclene muscle and middle. And in between them, there are three hypoacuic areas, one, two, and three. These are, here is the suprascapular approach. The upper trunk of the brachial plexus is here. This is C7. C6 and C5. There are other nerves, but we are concentrating on it. So these are the main trunks from where we start. So ultrasound probe position, there it is, to obtain transverse view of the brachial plexus in the interscreen area. Screen are the muscles, which are anterior, posterior, and middle. So ultrasound proposition to obtain brachial plexus here, you can see these are the one, two, and three. We can see the sternocleidomastoid muscle here. And this is the anterior screen muscle, the carotid artery. And here you can see the middle sclene muscle, internal jugular vein. By some compression, it is a bit compressed. And here you can see, indicated by these arrows, these are the roots, five, six, and seven, C6, C5, C6, and C7. Then we move it coronal oblique plane. So it was, if it is the neck, this was like this, the probe was like this. Now we are moving it like this. We are making it coronal. This is, this was the transverse, we make it coronal and oblique. So in the suprascapular, above the clavicle, so it is a supraclavicular fossa. Here you can see the supraclavicular fossa. The probe is placed in a coronal oblique plane. This is how it is placed. 
So here is the clavicle and we are putting it like this. Trying to look behind the clavicle. And behind the clavicle from the supraclavicular region, we will find some of the important nerves. Now, the suprascapular nerves are very important. They are the cutaneous branches of the cervical plexus and they contain fibers from C3 and C4 and divide into branches to supply the skin over the sternocleidomastoid joint medially to the skin overlying the upper deltoid muscle. Here we have the subclavian artery, anterior sclen muscle and middle sclen muscle. So we have come a bit downward from the main roots. Uh, in the previous image, we saw these three, five, six, seven. Now we have come downward, a finger, almost one finger down, and we have rotated the transducer in the coronal oblique plane. This is the coronal oblique plane. So we will get the branches which are coming out of these uh, roots, which we have scanned in the area which was above, one finger above the clavicle. Here we, will, we are getting the, the cutaneous branches. Then we come downward. Here is the clavicle. The first point was this, which was transverse oblique. Second point was this, which is supraclavicular region, and it was coronal. The third one is infraclavicular region. It is coronal transverse view. We will try to get the longitudinal, then transverse view for it. And again, in this area, here we have the axillary artery. Along with that is the lateral cord of the musculocutaneous branches of the nerves. All these are musculocutaneous branches of the nerves from the root 5, 6, 7, C. Medial cord is very important because it is the anterior thoracic, which is coming from C8 and T1. We will find it here. And then is the posterior cord. We will find upper scapular 5 and 6C. And the brachial plexus cords are visualized deep to the pectoralis minor around the axillary artery here. This is the axillary artery, so we can find the posterior cord, the brachial plexus. These are the brachial plexus cords. Then is ultrasound prop position for imaging the brachial plexus in the infraclavicular area. This is that, the similar one. And you can see the posterior cord here. This is nerve, posterior cord. Then we have a medial cord, well circumscribed area of the nerve. And this is the lateral cord. Here is the axillary artery, axillary vein and pectoralis minor muscle, tendon of it, and then is the pectoralis major. So once we put here, there, there is axilla, and we are here on the junction of the lateral one-third and medial two-third of the clavicle. Here it is. We will get this type of view in which we will find the axillary artery and vein. And along with that, we will have three cords of the brachial plexus. So medial, posterior, 
एंड लेट करना देन वी कम टू द एक्ला फिर वी आर इन द एक्ला इन एक्जिलरी रीजन द प्रॉब इज प्लेस्ड अगेन ट्रांसफर्स एंड हे यू कैन सी द एक्जिलरी आर्टरी विद बाइसेप्स एंड देन वी हैव द अल्लर नर्व रेडियल नर्व this is the area where they start at the median nerve and musculocutaneous nerve so along with the axilla on three sides in the axilla along with the axillary artery we will get the origin of ulnar median and radial nerves from the brachial plexus the same nerves when we scan we can see this is the ulnar artery and ulnar nerve this one here is the median nerve in this panoramic view the radial artery and radial nerve so in the hand we will have on the radial side on this side along with the radial artery we will get the nerve here so my fingertip is at the uh, here is the radial artery i can palpate and then is the radial nerve the median nerve is here and ulnar nerve is here along with the ulnar artery this is the ulnar artery and then we have the ulnar nerve so in cut section they will be more closer they will appear more closer and here we have the longitudinal view of ulnar nerve at wrist and a cut section in carpal tunnel syndrome so this is a condition in which the patient had the thickening of the flexor retinaculum in which the median nerve is hypoacuic here it is compressed and after the compression there is swelling this one is the flexor tendon so this is also called not sign the bulbous swelling of the median nerve proximal to the compression point which is proximal edge of the retinaculum in the proximal tunnel so this is the compression and here is swelling so we will have flattening of the median nerve at the compression point straight there is ulnar nerve ulnar nerve is one of the five terminal branches arising from the brachial plexus from the medial cord of brachial plexus and uh, it supplies motor and sensory in innervation to the upper extremity The ulnar nerve originates from uh, contributions of the ventral rami of C8 and T1 nerve roots. This is the humerus and ulna, and we have got the ulnar nerve. This is compressed ulnar nerve. These are two separate images. One is this one, another one is this. This is normal ulnar nerve, and here we have ulna and humerus here. and the nerve is compressed this nerve is normal this was in the cubital tunnel so we can have in the cubital fossa cubital tunnel syndrome and at the wrist we can have gion tunnel syndrome this is a case of cubital tunnel syndrome it happens when the ulnar nerve which passes through the cubital tunnel a tunnel which is of a muscle ligament and bone which is formed by three structures there will be a muscle a bone and a ligament whenever there is injury to the elbow the ulnar nerve becomes inflamed swollen and irritated so there will be pain numbness and this is the nerve in the cubital tunnel so the retinaculum will be thickened or you can see the ligament will be thickened 
This was in elbow inflection and on extension. Uh, you can see it is, here you can see swollen ulnar nerve. This is swollen ulnar nerve in flexion. Here we have scanned it in the cut section and then again in the cut section. The second important syndrome in the arm is Guyon's tunnel syndrome relevant to the ulnar nerve. It occurs at the wrist and near to the pisiform bone. Guyon canal syndrome is a relatively rare peripheral ulnar neuropathy and it involves injury to the distal portion of the ulnar nerve as it travels through a narrow anatomic corridor at the wrist. After ulnar nerve, we have the radial nerve. The radial nerve gives out muscular branches. This is the radial nerve. It gives us branches to supply the long head and medial head and later head of triceps brachii muscle and before and during its course to the medial uh, sulcus. It supplies the brachialis, brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis longus muscles. This is the spiral groove. The posterior tracheus neuropathy can occur here. And this is the Wartenberg disease can occur here in this area, but all three conditions, all these two conditions and even the compression can occur this groove. This is related to the radial nerve. The radial nerve at arm, you can see the triceps, biceps, brachioradialis. So the, this radial nerve supplies all these muscles. In elbow, this is how we scan, and you can see the radial nerve is here. This is the median nerve, and then the ulnar nerve will be on that side, on the on the medial side of the elbow. This is brachial artery. So distal to the lateral epicondyle, the radial nerve divides into the posterior interosseous and the superior radial nerves. Here you can see the radial nerve at rest, the longitudinal section, and here is the nerve with the Morton's neuroma, which is appearing from the nerve. So if we know how to scan, where to scan, we know the surface anatomy, we know the normal size and appearance of a specific nerve, then we can diagnose the pathologies. This was upper limb, then we come to the lower limb. The high resolution sonography, again, like upper limb can show normal nerve anatomy and same transducers 5 to 10, 10 to 13, or 8 to 14 are used. The first nerve is sciatic nerve. We know it is the longest, largest nerve in our body. And You might have heard about sciatica, which is due to compression of this nerve. And sciatica is the pain or discomfort in our body because of sciatic nerve compre is compressed or because of its uh, impingement, it is pinched. And mostly it is due to a lifestyle like uh, like us when we are sitting for longer durations and our nerve is being compressed or in overweight people or due to some injuries. So the rupture of the proximal common tendon of the hamstring causes the compression of the sciatic nerve. This is also called pseudo sciatalgia. This is a ganglion from the superior tibiofibular joint. Here it is the nerve and a ganglion is originating, a ganglionic cyst. 
it may compress the nerves because nerve is here this is a ganglion so it can compress it then comes the saphenous nerve it lies deep within our leg and provides sensation to our lower knee calf ankle and foot arch so these areas are supplied this is the sartorius gracilis semitendinosus and it supplies these areas we can have ganglia parasitica which is uh, due to abnormality or compression of the saphenous nerve and uh, the saphenous neuritis is a painful condition caused by either irritation or compression of the adductor canal or else where along the course of the nerve so here is infrapatellar branch injury after acl reconstruction this is tendon here is the bone So intrapatellar branch injury after ACL reconstruction. Then comes the tibial nerve. So tibial nerve, here you can see the flexor hallucis longus. And ultrasound is often negative because of the lesions which can be which can pro cannot be properly diagnosed and they are more stretched than compressing. In this area, instead of compression, there will be stretching of the nerve. That's why on ultrasound, the compression sign and inflammation will not be easily diagnosed in this area. There is the ganglion, which is originating from the nerve. These are a few cases. There is the sural nerve, the thickness of the Achilles tendon, which is misdiagnosed and not treated properly. The sural nerve is cutaneous nerve, and it provides sensation to the postulateral aspect of the distal part of the leg and the lateral aspect of the foot, heel, and the ankle. So Full thickness can be assessed. Here you can see the nerve is here, this one. It is cut section of the nerve. Sural nerve with uh, cystic neurogenic tumor. Here you can see. And then is the epineural cyst. Tibial nerve, uh, in case of tibial nerve, we can also have the tarsal tunnel anatomy, which is important to be considered if we know that uh, we can diagnose the tarsal tunnel syndrome also. Uh, we must know that the tarsal tunnel consists of two components, the tibutellar and tibucalcania. The tarsal tunnel uh, encloses three tendons, posterior tibialis or tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus, the posterior tibial artery and veins. And uh, we will have the tibial nerve also. We must know that the tibial nerve is one of the two terminal branches of the sciatic nerve. The largest nerve in the human body, which is the sciatic nerve. So it has got two branches. The tibial is one of that. The tibial nerve originates from the L4, S3 spinal nerve root and provides motor and sensory innervation to most of the posterior leg and foot. So here is the nerve in the telofibular area. In tarsal tunnel syndrome, the tibial nerve will be compressed. Uh, this tarsal tunnel syndrome is also called TTS and it is cause, uh, causing compression of the posterior tibial nerve 
as it travels through the tarsal tunnel. And the compression of the postural nerve can cause pain, tingling, and numbness of the foot. So painful condition in which the tibial nerve and its individual branches impinged or compressed as they travel through the tarsal tunnel. Controversial entity specific cause identified in only 60 to 80% of the cases. There is a tarsal tunnel and you can see the artery and veins and the tendons here, this is nerve, which is compressed and you can see it is swollen. Normally, the nerve will not be very much larger than the vein. So here it is very large. We can have focal nerve entrapment. The whole of the nerve is not entrapped or swollen. A part of it is entrapped here and then comes the swelling. Here you can see the normal nerve and then is the swelling, swollen. A normal nerve, here is the compression and then the nerve is swollen. So like this. Then we can have focal nerve injury from trauma creating a neuroma. Here is after the injury, there was a neuroma, a mass formation in it. And we can have extraneural uh, ganglia. The extraneural ganglia reside outside the peripheral nerve and usually arises from another portion of the nearby joint. The malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumors, we can have multiple types of nerve sheet tumors. Most common is schwannoma. In this case, it is arising from the ulnar nerve. Second last slide is about the nerve and conduction block and potential findings with the nerve that displays conduction block. First one, very important slide, the nerve appears to have focal swelling, but relatively normal fascicular architecture. So the these structures, which are the fascicles on ultrasound appear inadequate, which we discussed in the first two slides, will be very prominent. The nerve does not appear swollen, but there is a dramatically enlarged fascicle, one large fascicle. The third one is there is no discernible structure abnormality, so it remains normal. So if the conduction block is working, we can have a condition which is A. There will be focal swelling after we have given the block. The second one is in which one of the fascicles is enlarged because we have injected the medicine. And here it means it is not working. In conclusion, I can say that ultrasound is adequate and cost-effective for evaluating the involved nerve and adjacent processes that may be causing nerve compression in the upper limb by providing unique information on the nerve course, ultrasound has potential for major impact on treatment planning.